Amen. Amen. Last Lord's Day, we were together. Uh, you may remember I regaled you with a few pictures of our Western adventures, a few stories of our trip out west. You may remember that our family, five of the six of us, traveled over 6,000 miles there and back to Canada's western shores. But I wonder, what about you? What memories have you made so far this summer? We who live in a place like Chicago, I think, appreciate the summer months and the warm fall months, maybe more than other people do, because we know how long and cold and bleak and icy and slippery can be the winters. I wonder what memories have you made? Perhaps it was a shorter trip. A lot of us went on a little trip to Michigan on Monday, and that was a nice uh, day trip that we took. Maybe a block party or a local festival that you've gone to or are planning to attend. Perhaps a walk in the woods or a nap on a blanket upon green grass with warm sun shining down upon you and the breeze blowing across you. Maybe it was something simple like that. Perhaps a, a warm evening with the simple pleasure of warm breeze, soft moonlight, and twinkling stars above. As we learned last Lord's Day, God is honored when we enjoy his creation. You don't have to be in church. You don't have to be at a Bible study. You don't have to be serving at a local soup kitchen or food pantry to honor and worship the Lord. When we enjoy the life that Father God has given us, when we exercise the bodies that Father God has designed for us, when we appreciate the world that our good, good Father has made for us and created for us, we bring a smile to God's face. You see, when we enjoy God's good creation and give Him the glory, this too is worship. Now, you can go out in nature and have a grand old time and be like, thank my lucky stars, I had a great day today. But if you go out in nature and you see God's handiwork everywhere and you enjoy it, you give Him the glory, this too is worship. As a good father is pleased when his children enjoy the fruits of his labor, so our good, good father in heaven is honored when we appreciate his heavenly handiwork and his earthly splendor. And as we learned in review, God created all things for his glory. God created all things to give us knowledge of him. And God created all things for our enjoyment. He created all things for us to enjoy. By the way, I see David here. Last week we had his artwork featured on stage. Uh, today it's a little bit lower, but you can still see it. But can we just give David a thank you? <laughs> the, uh, the artwork is called Day 3, and it's a focus on the third day of creation and God's filling of uh, creation with wonderful things on day three. Let's build on the biblical understanding that we gained last Sunday as we take a closer look today at Psalm 19. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 19. We're going to walk through this uh, scripture together. We'll turn to a few other scriptures as well to give us more insight. Psalm 19. And we can summarize Psalm 19 as the skies, the scriptures, and the Savior. The skies, verses 1 through 6, the scriptures, verses 7 through 11, and the Savior, verses 12 through 14. And those verses we'll see point forward to the Messiah, to Jesus. Psalm 19 is a psalm of David celebrating God's revelation. Now, what is revelation? You say it's the last book of the Bible. Well, that's true, but what does that mean, that word mean, revelation? Revelation is truth about God's nature and power, about God's will and God's ways, about God's purpose and God's plan. Revelation is something we would not know unless God had pulled back the curtain in some way and shown it to us, made it manifest to us. That's why we call it revelation or reveal. Reveal is at the heart of revelation. God is revealing to us things that we need to know 
things that we will be held accountable for about himself. So in Psalm 19, we see that God's revelation of himself comes in three ways. First of all is general revelation. That's the skies, nature, creation. Second of all is special revelation. That's the scriptures. That's God's word, the inspired, God-breathed words that we have before us in the Bible. That's special revelation. And then we have God's final revelation or alternate revelation in the word made flesh. And who is that? Jesus. Jesus. The word made flesh. Now, when I was a student here in Chicago at Moody Bible Institute, we have three Moody Bible Institute students with us today. Let's hear it for Moody. Uh, one of my favorite weeks of the year, and I think it still is a favorite among students, was Missions Conference. Missions Conference. I especially loved at Missions Conference meeting the missionaries. I was kind of shy and timid my first couple of years, but by the time I got to junior and senior year, I looked forward to Missions Week, and I talked to missionaries and sat down with them and even made a couple of appointments with them, really because I was thinking about the future, and I was thinking maybe what they're doing was what I want to do one day. And had lots of conversations. And I remember uh, listening to their stories and gaining appreciation for their sacrifices, their experiences, and especially their heart for reaching the lost around the world and telling them the life-changing, eternity-altering good news of Jesus Christ. And I believe it was my junior year when I met a missionary. I'm not sure if he's still living or now with the Lord. A missionary to Japan. His name was Reverend Ralph E. Cox, and he gave me a copy of this book, and it's called God Is, God Spoke, God Came. God Is, God Spoke, and God Came. And those three concepts really are the backbone of Psalm 19, that God is, he reveals himself to all people in creation and nature, God spoke, that's his word, his special revelation, and God came, that's the word made flesh, Jesus, our sufficient Savior, and our risen Lord. And this book, by the way, was used by Reverend Cox and others in his ministry to bring hundreds of Buddhists and Shintoists, atheists, and evolutionists from those false beliefs to a firm foundation of belief in Jesus Christ. So if anybody wants to check out the book, uh, I have it. You're welcome to borrow it as long as you bring it back. Okay? As long as you bring it back. So without further ado, let's dive into Psalm 19 and talk about verses 1 through 6. We touched on these verses last week. The skies representing God's general revelation. God's general revelation. Verse 1 says... Uh, to the choir master, a psalm of David. By the way, Psalm 19 has some similarities to Psalm 18, and so it's helpful sometimes that we read the psalms together with the ones that are on either side of them. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So the very heavens, we're talking here about the skies that we can see when we look up or that we can feel the warmth of the sun. The heavens declare, they speak forth the very glory and handiwork of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Somebody said, well, how is it that I experience creation as an aspect of God's design? But others do not. If God is really speaking so loudly, why is it that others don't hear? <clears throat> Verse 2 continues. It says, day to day they pour out speech or revelation. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. That means that everyone, everywhere, in every culture, of every language, all around the world, all times and places, everyone who has ever lived on planet Earth has experienced the revelation of God in the beauty and wonder and majesty of his creation. There is no one who 
has excuse. As Romans 1 says, all are without excuse for God's divine power and his nature are seen in the things that he has created. Now, again, you say, well, why is it that some people don't see what I see? Verse 4 continues, their voice goes out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. All people everywhere are held accountable before God for the revelation they have received. And as Romans 1 says, they are without excuse before God. Again, why doesn't everybody see what I see? So I heard an illustration the other day of, imagine, okay, Jimmy, Sue, and Debbie are about five feet apart, right? Okay. Let's imagine that Debbie, I've, I've never heard Debbie shout super loud, but let's imagine that Debbie shouts as loud as she possibly can to Hi. Jimmy Sue. Hi! And we all hear it, but Jimmy Sue doesn't hear it. What would be something you might think was the case about Jimmy Sue if she couldn't hear Debbie yelling that loud to her? So, all right, Debbie, I want you to say something Jimmy Sue. Hi, Jimmy Sue! Did you hear that, Jimmy Sue? Okay, she did, so her ears are working great. Well, let's say that Debbie yelled at Jimmy Sue, shouted to her, and Jimmy Sue could not hear her. Something's wrong with her. What would we say? Okay, we'd say something must be wrong with her hearing, right? Yeah. Or we would say she's so willfully ignorant that she's just not paying attention to Debbie. She's ignoring her. All right, maybe you've had that happen where you talk to somebody and just ignore it. Yes. Okay? So one of those two things could be the case. That's the same thing when it comes to God's general revelation. You wonder why your family member, your friend, your neighbor doesn't see what you see when you look at creation, how they just see a bunch of random events coming together to make this universe. Well, number one, their spiritual ears have not been opened, and their spiritual eyes cannot see, all right? And number two, it's because perhaps they are willfully ignorant or ignoring what is plain to them, okay? So one of those two things is at work in those who don't see God's handiwork in creation. And so that's why the first step of evangelism or sharing Christ with others is always to pray. God, open their ears to hear your word. Open their eyes to see your revelation. And God, I believe, will be faithful uh, to answer those prayers as we continue to bring them before him. Now, verses 4 through 6 are what's sometimes called the Ode to the Son. And it's not an Ode to the Son God, but it's an Ode to the one true God for creating the Son. And the Son is something that all people experience. So not everybody gets to travel to places like this that we saw last week, right? Our family in Banff there uh, overlooking Lake Louise and beautiful mountains. Not everybody gets to see the grandeur of God in the mountains. Some people enjoy the beauty of the Lord in the flat plains and uh, the prairies or the oceans or the coasts, or you get the point. Not everybody gets to experience the same part of God's beautiful earth, but all of us, to some degree, experience the warmth of the sun and the effects of the sun. And by the way, there's my favorite picture of all, that beautiful picture of Tom. And, uh, I, I think I'm going to win an award of some kind. You know, one time I submitted a photo of mine to a, a, a book, and it got published, actually. It's a photo of a seagull over uh, Lake Michigan from the, the south shore of the Upper Peninsula. Uh, and then I realized when I got the book that there were some photos in there that were not very good. And all they were trying to do was get me to buy a book. So, but I am a published photographer nonetheless, so even though I think I got scammed out of 50 bucks. All right, so not everybody has that experience, but we all can experience uh, the beauty of the sun. It says in verse 5, uh, in the verse 4 rather, in them that is in the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun. So the tents like the atmosphere, the sky, the canopy. The sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. What a poetic description of sunrise. The bridegroom leaving his chamber like a strong man runs its course with joy. There's a sense in which creation has a joy of fulfilling the creator's design. It's rising 
is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now, by the way, as we progress from God's general revelation in creation to his special revelation in the word or the scriptures, we'll see that this is the connection here between nothing hidden from the heat of the sun and nothing hidden from the revealing nature of God's word. Uh, and Hebrews 4 talks about that as well. We'll be there in just a moment. So that's the beauty of the sun. Some of us who went to Michigan got to enjoy the sun on Monday, even though it was a rainy day. Now, first of all, we enjoyed pizza. And I think out of the several hours that we were in Michigan, we spent the majority of our time at a pizza fest at Silver Beach Pizza. Highly recommend their pizza. Very, very good. Uh, then we went to the blueberry field. That was sort of the main point of the trip to pick blueberries. But because we enjoyed so much pizza, we only had about 20 minutes to pick blueberries. So, uh, but we still picked enough blueberries for everybody on Wednesday that came and wanted some to enjoy some wonderful blueberries. And then, uh, this is a picture I took, maybe another photo book quality picture. I'm kind of shaking my head. Uh, a picture of a seagull in mid-flight. There you see the sun getting ready to set. There is that beautiful sun that has completed its course across the sky and is beginning to set. And as sunset came, uh, we got to uh, see it from the end of the South Pier in South Haven. Uh, that's not the entire group, but a lot of our group that was there, we were having fun as the water splashed on the pier. <laughs> and we sunset. Amazing! You listen really carefully when the sun sets over Lake Michigan, you can hear a little sizzle when it hits the water. No, you can't. It's, that's a joke. That's a joke. Can't hear a sizzle. And uh, there's a picture after the sunset, the beautiful skies. The sun has run its course for the day. And praise the Lord, Tuesday morning, guess what happened? The sun rose. The sun rose. And the sun will continue to rise and set until the day that God says enough is enough. And uh, the current heavens and earth pass away. God's judgment comes, and a new heavens and a new earth are brought about by the Lord according to his will. So that's the skies, God's general revelation. Now we move on to the second part of Psalm 19, the scriptures, God's special revelation. God's special revelation. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. What I want you to see in these verses is to notice how they describe God's special revelation in his word with an attribute and its effects. So let's take a look at the attributes. You'll see them on the screen. Uh, but these are the attributes. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. So these are some of the attributes of God's word. Perfect. Trustworthy, sure, right, pure, clean, true. This is how we should think of the law of the Lord and of God's word in general. 2 Timothy 3.16 is one that maybe you have memorized in the past. But it says, all scripture is breathed out by God, inspired by God. And profitable for teaching, that is, making known that which was not previously known. For reproof, that is, rebuking, confronting sin. For correction, that is, correcting error. And for training in righteousness and obedience in the way God wants us to live. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, some people say that uh, this is not uh, God's word. This is a, a book that's written by man. That's not what the Bible says. It says in 2 Peter 1, verse 20, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the people, real human beings with real personalities and real life situations who wrote this book were inspired by God. And the words that they wrote, we rightly consider and call the word of God. So the attributes of God's word, perfect, trustworthy, sure, right, pure, clean, true. And then 
we have not only the attributes, but the effects of God's word that are given to us here. So the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul or refreshing the soul. Now earlier, uh, someone was sharing with me about how going out in nature provides refreshment of soul. But even more so, sitting down with God's word, hearing from God as he speaks to us, as a father consoles and counsels his child, his son, his daughter. So God speaks to us and counsels us, reviving us, refreshing our soul. It says in uh, verse 7, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You say, what does that mean, making wise the simple? Here we are to think of the book of Proverbs with us three categories of people. You have three categories of people in Proverbs. Anybody know what they are? Wise. You have the wise, the fool, the fool and the simple. All right, so you have the wise person who lives according to God's revelation. You have the foolish person who rejects God's revelation. And then you have a simple person who's kind of on the fence. But the problem with the simple person, and that's what the Proverbs are written to, by the way. A foolish person is not going to read the book of Proverbs. All right, wise people live by it. But Proverbs is written ultimately so that the simple person might listen to lady wisdom and become wise and walk in God's ways. So the simple would be that fence sitter who's sort of in the middle and probably about to fall off and to follow. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. So the law of the Lord brings rejoicing of heart. Uh, verse 8 continues, the commandments are pure, enlightening the eyes. Enlightening speaks not only of bringing light in place of the ignorance of dark, the darkness of ignorance, but also enlightening the eyes speaks to alertness and obedience. It's clean and endures forever the fear of the Lord. Not talking about our fear of the Lord, but rather what God's word says about what it means to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The beginning of wisdom and what it means to fear God that endures forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So we have the attributes of God's word, the effects of God's word, and then we have the special emphasis upon the value of God's word. And if you are in Christ, God's word is so valuable to you. You want to read it. You want to listen to it. You want to hear it. You want to meditate upon it. You want to think about it. I don't do perfect every single day, but one habit of mine is every single morning when I wake up to listen to a scripture reading from God's word as I'm taking my vitamins and drinking my water, doing some mindless morning activities, to be meditating upon God's word, and in doing so every single day over the course of a year, reading the entire Old Testament twice, reading Psalms and Proverbs twice, and reading the New Testament twice as well. And, so, and it's a beautiful thing to do over the course of the year. You might have your own practices. Maybe you get your cup of coffee, you sit down with your Bible, start the day with God's Word, end the day with God's Word, even better. Uh, maybe at lunchtime, beginning, middle, end in God's Word. What's the value of God's Word to you? The psalmist tells us this, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey, droopings of the honeycomb. More by them is your servant born, and keeping that there is great reward. So he says, more to be desired is your word than gold, even the purest gold. So God's word, his will, his ways, is to be our desire more than untold wealth. Think about that time you bought the lottery ticket. Maybe you did it, and kudos to you. Well, the lottery ticket for the big, you know, I don't know, $1.5 billion jackpot. And maybe there was a moment just before they pulled the numbers where you thought, this could be it. It might just be me. And you start thinking about that untold wealth that's about to be yours. That feeling is how we ought to feel about God's word, the untold, untold wealth and value, our desire to hear and to heed the very word of God. Imagine the God of the universe has given us his special revelation. When the apostle Paul 
uh, speaks in Romans about uh, the tremendous blessing that is given to God's chosen people, the Jewish people, he highlights most of all that to them belong the law and the commandments. Everybody has general revelation, but let me tell you, not everybody has this. This is the most valuable possession that you have. The word of God, God's special revelation to you. Now, I'm not talking about the spiritual blessings, of course, that we have by grace through faith because of believing in the scriptures and the truths that they proclaim. But this is the most valuable thing you own. And yet for some of us, we might not have cracked it open for days. And perhaps it's sitting on your shelf dusty. Our desire to be more than untold wealth for God's word are the lights. The psalmist says that his delight, you know, I'm somebody who's got a sweet tooth. Raise your hand if you like me have a sweet tooth. Anybody? One thing I really love, I really love honey, but it's dangerous. If I get out the jar of honey and have a little bread there, all of a sudden I can go through a whole loaf of Italian bread or something with honey on it. It's so good, so wonderful. In fact, sometimes I'll let the honey soak in the bread so it becomes almost like a honeycomb. Uh, it's really cool. So, <laughs> shouldn't do that too much, all right? Our delight, though, what do we delight in? The sweetest of sweets, the most sensual of pleasures. God's word is greater than that, sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. And God's word, if we are warmed by God's word, if we keep God's law, there is great reward. It's our destiny, earthly protection, eternal reward. Our desire, our delights, our destiny. One author has said, God's word is the greatest treasure for those who love him. We love the Bible more than we love money. We love the Bible more than we love fine gold. God's word is our greatest pleasure. Sweet honey represents the pleasure of the senses, the finest tasting food, the best smelling perfume, the most fashionable clothes, the fastest cars, the best new songs on the radio, God's word is better. Amen? Amen. amen. I hope the amen of your mouth is matched by the amen of your heart as well. And finally, verses 12 through 14. In these verses, David leads us in a petition of humble confession, a cry for divine redemption, a plea for heavenly protection. But I want you to notice how these verses cannot be fulfilled in David's human life, nor in my human life or your human life. I believe these verses, like many verses in the Psalms, point forward through the centuries to Jesus, the son of David, who's going to fulfill these things ultimately. For it says in verse 12, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. By the way, that word hidden is the same word that is used earlier to speak of the sun and how nothing is hidden from its heat. And so just as nothing is hidden from the heat of the sun, so nothing is hidden from the evaluation of God's word. And that's exactly what Hebrews chapter 4 tells us. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So nothing is hidden from God. So the psalmist says, declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. So a hidden fault might be a sin that you commit you don't even realize. It. A lot of times these are goods that we leave undone. When we do something bad, we often feel a prick of guilt or a prick of shame. Uh, the Holy Spirit convicting us of that sin. But there are times where God wants us to do something good and we don't do that. That too is sin. Those two are hidden faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. This would be the transgressions where you say, okay, God, I know you drew a line in the sand, and I know you told me not to cross that line in the sand. You gave me a very specific command, but I'm going to cross it anyway. I'm going to do it 
anyway. I don't care what you say. That's the presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. By the way, that's why we are praying. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Then I shall be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Now let me ask you, was David blameless? Literally blameless? No. Was he innocent of great transgression? No. David committed some incredible transgressions against God, including adultery that led to a murder, that led to a cover-up, that led to a judgment in which a baby died, that led to a whole host of suffering. He wasn't a great father in terms of disciplining his children. He did it, uh, he took a census of the people and God told him not to. And so, and yet God says, I have found in David a man after my own heart. Because when David sinned, he confessed his sin. When he sinned, he humbly turned from his sin. He sought God. We see that here in Psalm 19. The psalm concludes, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That word rock reminds us of Psalm 18, uh, which concludes of, of talking about to God, our Savior, the, the rock, blessed be my rock, the God of my salvation. It says in Psalm 1850, great salvation he brings to the king showing steadfast love to his anointed to David and to his offspring forever. I believe these verses in Psalm 19 are to be prayed by us, even as David prayed them, but ultimately they point forward to Jesus, who alone will fulfill them, who alone is innocent of any hidden fault, who alone is kept from presumptuous sin, and they do not have dominion over him, who alone is blameless and innocent of transgression. Only Jesus, every word of his mouth and every meditation of his heart was acceptable in the sight of Father God. And so Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of these words. He is the word made flesh. Jesus is the final revelation of God, the ultimate revelation of God in those verses that we read from Hebrews chapter 1. So important uh, that I want to read them again. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So he's talking there about special revelation in this book, in the Bible. But in these last days, that is the days in which we are living, the Bible calls these the last days. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Remember, in the beginning was the word, the word was God. The word was with God. He is the radius of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. That's the Savior. That's Jesus, the Son of David, Christ the Lord. So these verses point forward to God's final revelation. Our Savior is innocent of hidden sins, and he is innocent of willful sins. Our secret sins, says one author, are no secret to God. Did you know that? The sins that you're so skillful at hiding from others are no secret to God. Only Jesus and Jesus alone obeyed God faithfully in the depths of his heart. Our Savior is innocent of willful sins. And because of that, he is sufficient to pay the price that was ours to pay and to save us from our sins. And so the scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 2, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, Jesus did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Because of his sinless nature, his divine nature, his human nature, he himself bore our sins in his body 
on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were strained like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. In just a moment, we're going to turn to a time of communion where we remember Jesus, his body broken for us, his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to think about that, I want to draw you to the picture on the screen. It's a picture of, of three crosses. You'll remember that Jesus was crucified on that day outside of Jerusalem. He bore in his body, on his body, our sins. He paid the price that was ours to pay. But you'll remember that there were others crucified with him. How many? Two others were crucified alongside of Jesus. So there were three crosses on that day. And the scripture tells us in Luke chapter 23 that two others who were criminals were led away and they put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They cast lots for his garment. People stood by. They mocked him. People scoffed him. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he's really the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him. They offered him sour wine. He said, if you are really the king of the Jews, save yourself. The inscription over his head read, this is the king of the Jews. Probably meant to mock him and the Jewish people, not knowing that it was indeed the accurate description and title for this one on the center cross. But then it says one of the criminals hanging beside him, railed at Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. So on one cross we have a man who is a scoffer, scoffing the Savior Jesus, mocking the Savior Jesus. Jesus. He could have called legions of angels, 12 legions of angels, to come to his rescue, but he did not because he was faithful in fulfilling the Father's will. The other criminal upon the cross rebuked the scoffer, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence and condemnation of death? We indeed suffer justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. So the first cross was the scoffer. But this other cross was a sinner. A sinner who recognized that he had sinned against society, sinned against God, who confessed and admitted his sin, and that he was indeed suffering justly the crimes that he had committed. And then, amazingly, the sinner turns from rebuking the scoffer. And the sinner turns his attention where a sinner must always turn his attention, to Jesus, the Savior on the center cross. He said to the Savior, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Savior said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so those three crosses, only one, a Savior, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. And yet, which of the other crosses are you or were you? A scoffer? Like the, the one who is being shouted at by God through the revelation of creation and the revelation of God's word and the truth about God's son, and you just cover your ears, you don't want to hear it, or maybe your spiritual ears aren't even working at all. And you scoff at God's revelation. You scoff at a supposed Savior. Save yourself if you're really who you say you are. 
Or are you like the sinner who recognized, man, there's a holy God and I've offended him and he's holy and his wrath is just and my condemnation of death, the wages of sin is death. I agree, that is just. <clears throat> and I have no other recourse but to cast myself at the feet of the Savior and to transfer any trust I had in me or society or anyone else wholly to Jesus and to cry out to him, save me, save me, remember me. And when we do that, the Savior looks at us and says, today, this very day, you are forgiven, you are redeemed, you are adopted. You're part of our forever family, hell canceled, heaven guaranteed. And if today were to be your last day, Jesus will say to you, today, when you close your eyes in death here on earth, you will open them in my presence in paradise. The sinner, the scoffer, the Savior. Let's turn our attention to the Savior. We're going to